Horizon. Just call me soon. Uh, I work for Only 18, a social enterprise which has successfully advocated for the lowering age, lowering of the voting age from 21 to 18. So we have successfully um, uh, advocated for that. And in if you are reading the news currently, there are still streams towards advocating it. So that's that. And I recently joined Only 18 in April as a campaign associate. So the question arises like, what happens when Only 18 is implemented and such? So that's where I come in to diversify what Only 18 can do. And that, and that includes such as matters including climate change, uh, anti-corruption, rights to information, and, and many more, which I will say since, since we label ourselves as a youth social enterprise, so we are, we are I will say, the pillars for, for youth concerns throughout Malaysia. So, Youth participation in politics is pivotal or important because it brings the energy and enthusiasm and charisma from the new generation of leaders to a whole new level. So each generation has their own ideology, their own ideas, their own manifestos. But if we would talk about those under Gen Z, it perhaps accounts to, correct me if I'm wrong, per se, 10% uh, of less MPs in parliament. As an example, we have like YB Prabhakaran, YB Sex Addict, uh, YB Tuan Lokalisman, YB Kevin Yee, and more who are within this generation status. When we don't have enough youth political figures in parliament, who can the youths of today look up to? I mean, they can look up to, to other figures, but to really look up to someone who can resonate, articulate, and feel like us, the youth, there needs to be more people there. Like, Sykes is one prominent figure there, but he's just one person. We need a variation of youth leaders addressing different causes so as so the youth of today can look up to. So to answer the question, why does uh, Malaysia need more young leaders in uh, politics or parliament? It's simple. We need change. Will we stay in the past with all these obsolete uh, draconian laws that does not bring much meaning to our everyday context today? Or do we submit to change and become change makers in order to make our country a better place? capping the age limit to sit in parliament from a personal stance uh, creates more opportunities for young people to rise up actually. So to some extent, it, it is also true that politicians and lawmakers age above uh, 65 may have good policies, vast amount of experiences and resources to carry out their own manifesto or plans. With, with the old mindset and the new mindset, example, Ketuanam Layu and maybe the new modernized idea here, are these ideas that these old people bring relevant to today's context. So a good example is when I remember Mat Sabu spoke in parliament about Ketuanam Melayu. He talked about how obsolete the term Ketuanam Melayu is and how it relates to white supremacy as similar to the American context. And he also emphasized how change is required in order for the, ent for the entire country populace to go forward. It has become so obsolete that we are still following that system of institution that it doesn't jive to, to our modern context. To the question, if it's able to end gerontocracy, definitely a yes. As, a, as an example, we cannot have, to some extent, have the same leader in a certain organization for three decades or further. It's, it's a clear definition of insanity. Uh, insanity means doing the same things over and over again and expecting different results. We have been living in a stigma of different of expecting different results, but to no conclusive end. So, and it really gives the youth more opportunities, more space and more avenues to stand up for politics. We don't need a leader to go for four terms of prime ministership all the way. Like, is it, it is good that we have altered our system to, to, to two terms, but again, there needs to be an insti institutional reform. And as per, as per the question here, gerontocracy is a good thing forward for the youth in Malaysia or in particular, the Raya Malaysia. when Pakatan Harapan won three years ago. So as you know, I was heavily involved in the NGO world. And when PH won, the NGO world celebrated all over the place. Then I asked the question, you know, we have won. So does our work here at the NGO ends here? And I remember my senior colleagues telling me, no, because this is just the beginning and, and the work never stops. Undi 18 as an organization 
if per se the only 18 bill was implemented and brought into action, will only 18 as an organization still be relevant? So it will, no doubt, because NGOs, CSOs, or movements that, that are not driven by only the objective with which they want to achieve, but by the cause. Example, only 18, uh, our objective is to implement the only 18 bill, but our cause is the youth cause. There is so much we can do, and there is no point stopping you just because we have won a battle, but the war hasn't been won. The future of youth movements, it will still be relevant. It will still flow and eventually there will be change. Maybe this certain youth organization who has done so much work for 20 years may no longer be relevant in terms of the people running it for the next maybe 20 years. But I will come back to the word which I have mentioned. Change will happen. Therefore, when the next generation of youth comes, they will take over the mandate of this certain organization and take over the torch to continue the good work that has begun from a long time ago. We are actually picking up stones left behind by the Reformacy youth. So it's a process. So we had the Reformacy saga. We had. We are now currently having our own saga now. And who knows what the next one will be. So it's a stepping stone age. We pick up from Reformacy. The next one will pick up from us. So in terms of the political dy that dilemma, change is bound to happen. And you know, it's just a matter of time. And it's just a matter of us. Uh, the current saga of youth to do what it can do. Many people will assume, will assume, speculate, and always press on the issue that lowering the voting age from 21 to 18 is only a mere difference of three years. So three years is nothing, many people will say, but to me personally, that three years, which includes mathematically 365 days times three, that brings a lot of meaning. So as such, we can have more youth participation at an earlier age. We have more youth talking. We can have more youth talking about uh, social works, political works, e economical works, environmental works, and other aspects which concerns them. So there will be a no doubt a higher rate of youth participation in democracy and societal activities. It also provides a space to create capacity building, le leadership discourse, and. I think most importantly, exposure to youth welfare in this, in this context. There will be significant implications. There might be a, a rise in politi youth political figures such as the Reformacy Saga, and there will be a rise in youth participation in politics, not necessarily in politics, maybe social work, volunteering work, and environmental work, and many more. Protest, I must say, is a battle. And in a war, there are multiple battlefronts. So to some, to some extent, protest can bring change at a small and short-term scale. Because protest is constrained to a certain group of individuals, such as in Hong Kong, we have the student movement started by Joshua. In Thailand, we have the movement started by the grassroots movement there. In America, we have the BLM movement started from the black minority groups. So protest can bring a change. In an ultimatum, it changes the mindset and thinking of people in society. In a protest, you can do so. You can do so much at, at this period of time. Recently, we had several protests. Even though during MCO, uh, we have like the only eighteen bill protests in the at parliament last two months, and then we had recently last two weeks or three weeks ago, we had the Booker Poster Booker Parliament protests. So, for us here, I mean, our institution, though it may have its goods and bads, we start for we we start small first. We mobilize our certain communities to. To do something for our country. That's where these two protests came, came about. To answer the question if Malaysia will have a similar protest, now this is my uh, personal point of view. So if the government is not careful and the riot is pushed to the corner too much, if the government does not make a correct chess move, the riot might be on the brink of an explosion. We have been living in a system that has, over time, as per I mentioned just now, uh, become obsolete and we need an institutional reform. But the problem is there is not much awareness and acknowledgement from the, var the various population in Malaysia, the various right in Malaysia. We are not acknowledging that our system is weak and it requires desperate change. We are living in a system that suppress us from all direction. I mean, sure, we can live like normal, like you and I now, we are living normally in this environment now, but to some extent, 
when are we going to leave our bubble and make a change for our country? AUKU, AUKU for short, has been an ongoing issue for years since reformacy. I believe there were clauses in the AUKU Act which was amended during the tenure of uh, YB Mazli Malik back in the PH administration. So a little bit of context, if I remember, the AUKU was amended in terms of political participation in university grounds. So that means uh, students, university students in 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 a uh, in university grounds can join political parties, can talk about politics in uh, university now. But correct to your question, it has not been repealed, hence hindering the term, I've used the word, freedom of expression and freedom of, of information in university. Why is there a need for a repressive law that hinders university students to speak? I mean, in high school and primary school, to some extent, we, we get silence and in university, again, to be silenced. So the question of... Is there any for an Oku? It should never ever be even brought up in our context ever. It is never Oku is never even needed in the first place. Its only need or purpose is to suppress and oppress university students' views. And again, it, it hinders our academic freedom and in doing and, and in doing so hinders our thought of critical thinking. Because if they do not talk about it in their yeah, university days, which is the time of their lives, it might be too late to talk about it when they enter working life, where the constraints in working life is so big that there is no space to talk about it. So every moment in university life counts and Oku is never, never needed. So we need to break the stigma of allowing, in relation to youth, Oku also, in relation to our education system, in allowing the youth to speak up, to express, and, and to just talk about the little things that matters without having, without having any fear of getting arrested, without having fear of any getting backlash from anybody. My advice um, to those who have uh, engaged in politics or are well-versed in politics, well, very good for you, but do spread the good word around about the need for political literacy and the, and the need for youths to engage with everyday activities. Don't just constrain to just politics, but there are also many pathways such as environmental, social work, uh, economical work, and indigenous work, and more. And I think some final words, if this is the final thing. Uh, us youth, we have a fundamental duty and purpose to society. So no doubt there are many challenges, but I believe, and history can also beg me, that we will persevere because uh, when we share the pain of the people around us, we also share the dream that we aspire for. Uh, this, is, this is in order to build a world of love, peace and harmony.